If you thought your reserved D-Box seats to the 3D IMAX showing of Star Wars The Force Awakens cost an arm and a leg, huh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Internet, welcome to Film Theory, where today, hold on to your fitted Jedi leggings, aka your jeggings, ha <laughs> ha, because we're talking about the economics of building the Death Star. And before you wander away thinking that this is just gonna be a bunch of math for the next 15 minutes, well, there's gonna be some math, but that math will totally be worth it, because by the end of the episode, you're gonna learn that there's a force in the galaxy far more dangerous than the dark side, and that force is market force. And in the context of that force, the Jedi are far more destructive than the Sith ever will be. Seriously. Get ready to never look at this scene the same way again. It seems like the logical place to start is to figure out how much the Death Star actually costs to make. I mean, this is one massive ship, right? So before we go making any big revelations about Star Wars, we have to get down to nuts and bolts. Literally. According to Wikipedia, the hull of the Death Star is made out of a substance known as quadanium steel. According to the information we have, all the outside parts of the Death Star are made from this steel alloy, which is supposed to be a super strong armor. And while it may be tough, it's not like it's impenetrable or anything, since all the generations of TIE fighters we see in the original trilogy were also made out of this alloy. We also see that it can be blown up pretty much like any other regular ship. So it's a special steel, but since there's not a lot of information on it and it looks and functions a lot like normal metal, in our calculations we're going to just treat it like a regular steel alloy. Fortunately for us, some economic students and fellow Star Warsians at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania actually calculated how much steel it takes to build the Death Star. As with any fictional device, that you're trying to bring into the real world, you're gonna face some limitations, and as a result, make some assumptions. For them, they compared the Death Star to what would basically be a battleship, but instead of floating on water, it floats in space. This is pretty rational, since they both need to be protected from all kinds of weaponry, both have to be airtight, and they're both weapon platforms that need to be totally self-contained, either in the vacuum of space or in the middle of the ocean. Next, they took the dimensions of the Death Star, which according to the Star Wars Encyclopedia and the online wikis, is 100 40 kilometers in diameter, or about 87 miles across. Just to give you some context, that's 1 25th the size of the moon. Next, they scaled everything up from a modern warship to the size of the Death Star, and found that you would need 1.08 times 10 to the 15th tons of steel to construct, as in 1.08 times 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 And sometimes this happens with our theories, right? Where the numbers just get so ridiculously big for us to even know what they mean, so let's put this in perspective. Comparing that number to the steel on Earth, it actually doesn't look that crazy. Based on the amount of iron in the planet Earth, iron alloy makes steel, by the way, just so you know, you could actually produce 2 million Death Star shells out of it. Granted, the Earth would literally be mined dry, completely gone, and the core would be gutted, but it seems like producing just one measly Death Star wouldn't be such a big deal. That is, until you look at how long it actually takes to turn the raw iron into steel. At the current rate Earth produces steel, it would take our planet more than 800,000 years just to get enough for the Death Star. And that's not even counting all the other components and parts that you'd need for such a massive space station. How long does it take to produce enough steel to build your everyday warship for the ocean? Less than an hour. Okay, so this is gonna be a big project. But it doesn't stop there. Knowing how much steel it takes is all well and good, but you can't just mine a gajillion tons of steel for free. That much steel Steel is gonna need some serious cash. Here's where the numbers get really crazy. Our friends at Lehigh kept researching the stats of the Death Star and were able to calculate that at the price of steel in 2012, 1.08 times 10 to the 15th tons of steel would cost you about 852 quadrillion dollars. Compare that to the gross world product for 2014. That's how much money was produced by the entire world economy of every country in a year. The gross world product in 2014 was 77 trillion 868 billion 768 million dollars. That means the price for just the steel on the Death Star would be almost 11,000 times all the money made in the world in a single year. And I want to make sure that we're really clear here that this isn't just some huge number I'm waving out in front of you. This cost of the Death
Death Star has actually been verified in writing by our own US government. Good job guys, these are the sorts of things that you should be wasting your time on. A couple years ago, a petition for the US government circulated to build a real Death Star, under the assumption that it would help us bolster our national defense, and obviously fend off the Rebel Alliance. Sorry, I just love that this was a real thing that happened. It got so many signatures that the White House officially responded to it with a huge letter. Even though they ultimately declined the request to build a gigantic death ray in space, they did use data to back up their decision. They also pointed out that blowing up planets isn't a good idea, but offered an alternative solution. If the government wasn't going to fund it, you could always ask for private funding through NASA's Commercial Crew and Cargo Program Office, otherwise known as C-3PO. I kid you not. The world is run by a bunch of nerds. It is glorious. So yes, confirmed by the US government, this is seriously what it would cost to build a Death Star. And we're just talking about the basic model. Remember, you also need a lot more than steel to keep this thing going. You need tons of quarters for crews, you need all the internal life support systems, onboard computers, laser engines, huge plasma containment cells. The steel is just the beginning. Again, making the best comparison we can between the Death Star and a regular warship, we we can make a rough calculation for how much the rest of the components would cost. Our friends over at Lehigh use the USS Gerald Ford, which cost $17.5 billion, including R&D. If we extrapolate that out to the Death Star, the total cost for the first Death Star would be as high as $193 quintillion. So that's how much the Death Star would cost in our Earth dollars today, and that seems like a lot, right? And it is for a single planet. Remember, we're only looking at it from Earth's perspective. The Death Star was built using an entire galaxy's worth of resources, where there are thousands of inhabited planets and trillions of people. Coruscant alone has over one trillion inhabitants. When you look at it that way, and also that it took about 20 years to build, it's actually not that bad. But while the cost of building the Death Star isn't that big of a deal in the grand scheme of the galaxy, the cost of destroying the Death Star is something else entirely. When the first Death Star was being built, almost everyone in the galaxy was pretty much just going about their own business. Like we said, building the space station doesn't really affect them all that much. It's a government project, just like building a bridge. But when good old Luke Skywalker comes along and uses the force, that's when the real problems for the galaxy start. I'm not talking about planets blowing up. Although, yeah, sorry about that, Alderaan. <laughs> I'm talking about everyone's worst nightmare, a recession. And before you laugh this off, a recession across an entire galaxy is no cakewalk. The biggest issue here is that terrorist attacks hurt the economy, and bad. And destroying the Death Star would be labeled as the largest ever act of galactic terrorism. Oh yeah, it's easy to forget amidst the cool laser swords and fun space battles that the rebels are exactly that rebels. Sure, the government may be controlled by an evil Sith Lord, but it's a stable system. And even then, the majority of the populace don't even realize that Vader and Palpatine are all that bad. To them, Luke, Han, Leia, and all the rest are extremists, trying to overthrow the government and just successfully blew up the largest military base in history. And that isn't good. Compare the Death Star attack to something we know here, the 9-11 attacks. Following 9-11, two of the world's most important stock indexes, the Dow Jones and the S&P 500, dropped overnight by 14% and 12% respectively, and then stayed there. Now, you don't have to know what those are. It's a topic for another day. What you do need to know is that sudden double-digit drops like this result in economic crashes, as consumers become nervous and spend less money, which in turn results in less income for companies. Companies are then forced to make layoffs, and the resulting higher unemployment means even less spending. Lower productivity for everyone, companies and individuals alike. The economy economy struggles to recover. Destroying the Death Star would cause this kind of collapse, except instead of being on a national scale, this would literally ripple across thousands of other planets. The other big problem in the destruction of the Death Star is the murder of major political and military figures. This might seem like a good thing because, yeah, we got the bad guys, especially with the second Death Star, you're talking about killing Emperor Palpatine, but history shows that killing off major world leaders doesn't exactly stimulate the economy. This is comparable to April 23rd, 
2013 when the Associated Press made a mistake of tweeting that the White House had been hit by a terrorist attack and that President Obama had been injured. Of course, the tweet was wrong, but in the four minutes it took before they got it retracted, the stock market dropped by 1%. In four minutes! There's no question that the immediate impact of Luke destroying the Death Star would be to send the galactic economy reeling. The Galactic Trade Federation would take a huge hit, slowing down all the major galactic trade routes and causing serious resource so resource sh shortages and causing serious resource sh shortages. I cannot say that. I cannot say that for th that is really hard to say. Resource shortages causing serious resource shortages as remote planets see their imports take a big hit. Oh, I did it. And things only get worse from there. Remember the rebels destroy two Death Stars and when Palpatine died in Death Star 2, his absence would lead to a temporary collapse of the entire political system. Without any sort of central structure or leader, this collapse would also mean that the Empire would have defaulted on all of its debt to the planets. That might not seem like a big deal, but it means that basically the Empire can't pay anyone back for anything, including the Death Stars. All those resources and money you used to make this thing, to use a phrase from South Park, and it's gone. These are the most expensive military projects in history, not to mention the Empire has been financing a war against the rebels for years, one might call it a war on terror, and now none of it can be paid for. All the industries related to military and arms manufacturing would collapse, and many other industries would follow suit as a result. So what does all this mean? Well first of all, it means that destroying the Death Star is a lot more complicated than the good guys won! In fact, it's pretty reasonable to think that destroying the Death Star and Emperor Palpatine wouldn't lead back to a prosperous democratic republic where everyone gets flowers and medals, it would actually lead to a deep recession and a massive power grab where lots of individual factions rush to try to fill the void left by the Emperor and take control of the galaxy. Meanwhile, the ordinary citizens of the galaxy would suffer for years to come, cut off from all supplies and resources from other planets, stuffing their credits into their mattresses and waiting out the recession caused by the Jedi. Destroying the Death Star would actually have the exact opposite effect that Luke and the Jedi think it will. Economists, they are not. And that's the point here. Ultimately, there's a big difference between a political revolution and a violent revolution. We think of Emperor Palpatine as being this really destructive guy, but his revolution from Old Republic to Empire was much smoother and safer economically than the rebels' hostile takeover. Sure, Palpatine used manipulation and coercion to get power and eventually bumped off a few Jedi but he pretty much left the galactic population alone in the process. Everyone else was able to live their lives without too much problem. Again, sorry Alderaan bummer for you. The armed and violent coup that the Rebel Alliance performs is much more sudden and ultimately more destructive to more people. Really, if the Rebel Alliance truly wanted to bring peace to the galaxy, a better way of life for everyone, to reform their republic, they would have needed to take a page from the dark side and work a little magic behind the scenes rather than destroying not just the Death Star, but the whole galaxy's way of life. So what, The Force Awakens takes place 30 years after the original trilogy? Huh, no. Everyone there should be in utter economic devastation. That's the true story of The Force Awakens. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. And if you can't get enough Star Wars, find out even more hidden truths about the dark side and light side of the Force by clicking here to watch my friends over at Screen Rant. They just did a theory exploring how George Lucas made the Force to parallel the Eastern yin and yang symbol, finding clues as to how the new trilogy's story will unfold based on this balance of dark and light. It's a really cool analysis. Kinda wish I'd thought of it myself, actually. Or if you're kinda Star Wars'd out for the time being, click here to learn how to do the Kamehameha wave from Dragon Ball. Surprisingly, there is a real world explanation for what you're seeing here. Still no explanation though for how inept Yamcha is. That guy, man. Useless. Just, just useless. And finally, make sure that you subscribe because we have theories on Batman, Superman, and Full Metal Alchemist on the way.